Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2, Super Mini Mail Call episode. And yeah, I know, hardly Super Mini anymore, are they? Uh, we have a box here, a rather large one, and it says, um, I don't know, made in Taiwan. This looks like a case box. This one comes from a UPS store in New York. So when UPS sends these, they never put the original person's name on the label. So let's see what we got in here. Now I talked about shipping and shipping prices in I think the last mail call episode, or maybe the one before that. And um, I mentioned that I had heard pirate ship is a really good way to ship packages. And then a bunch of viewers chimed in saying they completely agree. And the prices of pirate ship is way, way cheaper uh, than if you just walk into a store, like a UPS store or the post office or whatever. So if you're based in the US and you're thinking of sending something, I don't know, based on viewer feedback, pirate ship seems to be a good choice. Um, no affiliation, not a sponsor or anything like that. Um, inside the box here, we have something that, I don't know, it's like a double box thing going on. What, what is this? Is this something I ordered? Oh no, 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 okay. I know what this is. <laughs> it's, an, it's a new old stock notebook computer. Now this was sent in by a viewer and um, this viewer, and hopefully there's a letter in here. If not, I'll dig up the email. This viewer used to own a business that sold these laptops. And when he decided to, you know, not uh, do his business anymore, he ended up with a ton of these unused new old stock laptops. And these things are like, I mean, look at it. It's like absolutely mint condition. Now, from my recollection of the email, these things are sort of like, I forgot the brand name, not one of the name brands, not HP or Dell or whatever. This was one of the OEMs that ends up making laptops for a bunch of the other companies. And then these have like some amount of configurability. And back in the old days when, like I think it's a Pentium laptop, back in the day when these were sold, you used to see various companies selling these exact laptops with their own branding on it in the magazines. So that's what this is. And it allows you to configure everything to the best of your ability. So this is actually seriously a brand new laptop from I think the, like the later 90s that's never been used. So I'm gonna set up my phone so we can have a separate camera angle here. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that'll be kind of cool for the unboxing, uh, better than like this typical view that I have here on the mail call episodes. Alrighty, there is the box. Uh, sorry about the color balance, by the way. I'm using the NDI streaming app to stream to OBS for the capture here. And on the iPhone, which is what I'm using right here for this capture, the color balance down here in the basement is just all over the place. It will constantly change. And unfortunately, there's really no way I can fix this. I can't lock the exposure or white balance or any of that stuff in this NDI app. It's a bit primitive when it comes to settings. Anyways, there is the laptop. It's just basically brand new. And if we turn the box on the side here, we actually have some configuration dots here. So we have TFT 12.1 inch for the screen, nothing for the hard drive, keyboard, it says US, RAM, I think eight megabytes, <laughs> not a lot. Video memory, two megabytes and accessory CD-ROM. And on this side here, this nice uh, generic box with a, there's a dude there and a cup of coffee and a people in a meeting. Cause you know, you got your computer that you wanna have in your meetings. Uh, MPEG and other things are options and also DSTN as a screen option. I'm glad that we do not have that. I have the email here that was sent about this computer and this does come from viewer Don. Okay, so it says here that this machine is made by the company AlphaTop and AlphaTop made the early Apple laptops for Apple and um, this particular computer is branded green. I think the 753. And these laptops were sold under dozens of local and national brands. Some were sold as Micron and even NEC. The new old stock green 753, which is obviously what's in here, is a Pentium 1 non-MMX sealed in the factory box. Looks like it has a built-in CD-ROM drive, or I don't know if it's uh, at the same time as a three and a half inch disk drive, it has both. Intel socket seven CPU up to 200 megahertz, 72 pin FPSO DIMMs, which are the small little memory modules. And the BIOS can support hard drives up to eight gigabytes without using an overlay. So yeah, there we have it. We have a basically a brand new, oh, there's the color balance changing. We have a brand new machine. That's just amazing. I'm just moving the camera out of the way. Let's unbox this thing. Let's see what's in here. I can't believe it. New old stock. So yeah, um, typical packaging here. Maybe I should make the camera 
a little higher so we have a better view down into the box. Opening something like this is a real treat just because, you know, I never got to have a brand new laptop. Back in the 90s, these things were super expensive. So uh, we got a little box on the top in here with a little filler foam. Got some manuals and paperwork here. I'll just pop this out of here. This is a terrible unboxing video, absolutely terrible. So what do we have here? PCMCIA driver, it's so generic. It's the card wizard. <laughs> Uh, we have the Transit Puma SIR wireless connectivity software, Transit Puma, okay. We have an addendum. What does this talk about? Pentium CPU, two and a half inch hard drive. Looks like some switches internally for up to 150 megahertz, 3.3 volts. Pretty sweet. Oh, and look at this, the super generic manual for the, for the computer. Very nice. Oh, look, there it is. That's what the computer's gonna look like. Normal BIOS in there. And, oh, and another one of these. So yes, there were two. <laughs> okay, well, looking inside here, looks at that. So there's the computer in its factory fresh seal. And then we have the carrying case here. Leather, faux leather, I take it. Let's take a look at this. Look at that, perfect condi condition, no mildew, no nothing. There's stuff, something in here, maybe the power supply. Let's see. We, oh yeah, there's goodies in here. Tilt the camera up a little bit. Um, there's the Puma software. We got pointing device driver. Okay, some stuff like that there. Then there is, looks like a hard drive caddy or a blank or something. And then that is the power supply for the computer. Some more software, PCMCA drivers, CD-ROM drivers for TX CD-ROM, another set of drivers. We got a regular power cord and the shoulder strap for this carrying case. It's just amazing because a lot of times when you see this stuff, it's covered in mildew because it's been like improperly stored. I don't mean new old stock, but you know, like if this computer were we're sitting around in someone's um, garage or basement or whatever. But there it is, look at that. Look at that, freaking perfect, perfect condition. So let's slide this baby out. So I think I've sort of mentioned, I have a few of these types of laptops, Pentium era, and it's not really my jam. You know, this era of laptops, not my thing. I don't love this era because I feel that like laptops today aren't really a compromise. They're just as powerful as desktop computers. Not, not just as powerful, but they're very fast and computers are so fast. But back in the day with these types of laptops, your performance really suffered. Screens on these things were always not super great. So you always had a real compromise thing going on. Not to mention, you know, this thing's relatively thick and everything. So it's not super light. It was great if you just needed a laptop, I mean, portability and all that, but I never was big into that back in the day. I wonder if there's a date like in the manual here. Let's see, what does it say on the back? Rev 4, and there it is, manual edition 4.0, March 1996. Anyways, as I was saying, 1996, so Windows 95 era and Windows NT, I don't know if it was 4.0 yet, but like 3.5.1 I think was the version of NT. It's, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess I was, was I using an Amiga? I think I had a PC. I just, I wasn't paying attention to laptops at this point in time. And I think it was predominantly because I was building my own PCs and these laptops were so expensive compared to the price of a PC. The price of a laptop now, you can get laptops for hundreds of dollars. Like a decent laptop is, you know, six, seven hundred dollars. But I would say, and I don't know, maybe I'm just talking out my, you know, behind here. Feels like back in the day, at least with name brand laptops, you were paying like double to get a similarly specced Pentium computer, du at least double. And if you added the RAM and you know a good screen, I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. I used to go to the computer swap meet to build my computers. So I wasn't, I, I don't know, I just, I never really looked at this stuff. But back to what I was saying, I have a few other laptops of this generation that viewers have donated and they work. There's like a tough book and I have a Toshiba and I, I don't know, one or two others and they're all fine. So when I need to run something of this era, I got those laptops, they're, they're great and they're reliable, but I'm not really into them. I don't feel like a nostalgia factor with those. 
So when Don offered me this, initially I was just like, ah, you know, no, I, I already have laptops. I don't need another one. But then when he mentioned that this is like new old stock, <laughs> I couldn't resist. I honestly could not resist. And the reason for saying yes was really the fact that this thing is new old stock. And that is just a very, very rare thing now. So in the recyclable packaging here, let's get the tape off of here. Feels like, uh, I don't know if there's a battery in here or not. Maybe, maybe not. Not that the battery would be working anymore. I can't imagine from 1996 to now, but I don't know, anything is possible, I suppose. It's pretty heavy as one would expect. Oh, it's just perfect condition. It is absolutely perfect. So I suppose right here is where your company branding would go. Not a normal PC size, uh, you know, hole there, but uh, I, you know, this thing doesn't feel like it was ever opened and let's smell it. It doesn't really smell like anything actually. No, it doesn't. Uh, this is obviously where the hard drive goes. I have a feeling it uses an IDE three or two and a half inch hard drive. And there was the tray, it was in the bag. I think it's right here, here it is. Keyboard and mouse. We have sound in and out, a microphone port, couple card slots there, TV output. So it looks like a composite jack. Indeed, this thing has a floppy drive right there. On this side over here, we have a CD-ROM drive. <laughs> okay, so they're both in there. That's freaking cool. On the back here, we have the DC power input, the infrared blaster. Let's get this little door open here. VGA, a game port? On a laptop, sweet. Parallel port, serial port. And this here looks like it's some kind of a docking station connector. Ah, yes, that is a docking station connector. So there must've been a dock you could get for this thing. I don't wanna break anything here. It's not like it's you know been baked. It's been climate controlled its whole life. I thought I heard something floating around inside. On the bottom here, we have some ventilation, some access probably for the CPU and probably for the RAM. We'll take a look at that closer on the in a second. And we have the label, which we'll take a look at in a second. Let's open this up. Oh, look at the top here. There is an LCD, a one line LCD there. Sweet, love that. Uh-oh, uh that was... Uh, button here is kind of, oh no. Well, <laughs> is that the first casualty? Or is that, no, that's not supposed to come off, is it? <laughs> it is not supposed to come off. Is that broken? Oh, it's broken. All right, we'll have to take a look at that in a second. But yeah, this is like a Sugart floppy drive lever and it has a, a little pin that sticks into it right there and it broke. So I, and that wouldn't have been from impact. You know, this thing was really, really well packed in all this super dense foam. And this was already broken. So this is probably just a design flaw. So even new old stock stuff can sometimes be broken. All right, let's open this up. Look at that. This is obviously to protect the screen. Get this off of here. No dust, no fingerprints, <laughs> just a virgin laptop from the 90s <laughs> look at this really sweet keyboard is not too bad wow okay uh, you can see the one line lcd here i'll zoom in a little bit so there's the one line lcd we have a power button there looks like you have a way to release the keyboard here this was something that was possible on these old computers talk about serviceability you flip these to the side and then the keyboard pops up and then you can lift it down like this. And I'm not sure why. Maybe you take this cover off here, like you remove these screws here and then the CPU is underneath there. But that was not atypical for back in the day. Also means if you need to switch out the keyboard, it's very easy. So you just push down and then we flip these levers back. Oh, it's really a shame about this though. So this latched the screen closed. And I think what you do is you just give it a push and there's a little spring mechanism here. And then that would unlatch to allow you to like open the screen. All right, now we're looking at the top down view. Let's flip this over so we can get a better look at the bottom here. So there's the label. It's the green 753, 19 volts at 34 watts. There's an FCC ID made in Taiwan. This thing is just freaking nice. Look at this. Got a little cover thing going on here. And this is another removable cover right there. And this right here looks like a removable cover somehow, but I don't know how. It doesn't have a screw. 
Yeah, it doesn't seem to just want to release very easily. Okay, looking here, this is obviously the battery compartment. So I remember Don saying there was no battery, which is fine because, um, you know, it's not really safe after this many years anyways. It's nice that it doesn't have a gaping hole where the battery's not installed, because that would be a bit of a bummer. Here in the manual, there it is, the battery going in, hard drive going in there, card slot, and the CD-ROM drive. For whatever reason, if you have the TFT screen like we do, you can run the LCD and the CRT at the same time, but not with the dual scan. Poor dual scan users. Looking through the manual, nothing really out of the ordinary here, but here's that port replicator that connects up. This is like the docking station, so to speak. Looks like uh, at least it connects power and maybe has a set of ports. I don't see the ports on there, but my assumption is it's on there for easy connection. Looks like this has a Cirrus Logic video card inside. So it's talking about using drivers there. Looks to have an ESS 1788 sound chip, keyboard controllers a Mitsubishi M38802, and the keyboard is a Sunrex 86 keys. After getting this thing booted up, I have a compact flash adapter installed where the hard drive would go. So uh, there is a, here's a hard drive right there, just a regular old drive. It goes in like so, screws into the case there, but it's just easier to use this because then we can use the compact flash card that I usually just use on, well, everything <laughs> for booting and testing and has all my utilities and stuff on there. Ideally, we wouldn't want this thing to like flop around so much in here, so maybe uh, let me think of something to do. Maybe it involve some of this bubble wrap. The hard drive sled it just slides in. There's a little latch right here to hold it in place. I have the power supply connected up. There is a green power LED, but let's... Uh, oh, wow, this is a multi-pin thing. So I won't easily be able to test that. Okay. Well, let's plug it in and let's hope for the best. Okay, nothing bad is happening. All right, so... Let's open this up. Oh, I don't have to push that. It doesn't even latch. All righty, there we go. Let's power this on. Oh, all right. Sounds like it's working. We have a power LED here or like on the LCD screen. Nothing on the screen though. CD-ROM drive opens. So there's definitely power, but I don't remember if this thing has no CPU in it. That's what I don't recall. Hmm. Because there doesn't appear to be any activity whatsoever. I need to go read the email from Don. I'm going to pull the power cord out because pushing the power button doesn't seem to do anything. Okay, so reading the email, yes, there's no CPU in here. We have to remove the keyboard and then uh, that plate under there has where the CPU is. Extra 72 pin dim memory goes in the bottom side of the laptop, max is two times 16 megs. CPUs from 90 megahertz and faster are supported, but a 133 or 166 Intel, plain Jane, not MMX are both good CPUs for this laptop. Okay, let's do that. So with the bench down view, let's uh, flip these switches here. So let's get the, the keyboard up again. Just gently move this out of the way. Looks like there's a little dead fly right here. Let's get this ribbon cable out of here. It looks like this pulls out, I think. Yep, there we go. Now there's some screws here. I'm just gonna start taking out screws and hopefully we got the right ones. So I took those two screws out, one there, and it looks like a fourth screw at the top here. And then this should come out. There it is. All right, look at this. Look at that, a normal CPU socket. It's like a ZIF socket of some kind, but I guess you just use a screwdriver. And what about a heat sink? This is a 133. And this goes in, which way? Okay, is that open? Oh, the CPU's got bent pins. Okay, we're gonna use a different one. All right, this one here says 166. Let's try again. I think we've got a bent pin on this one as well. <laughs> I don't think I've like ever checked. No, it's got bent pins, darn it. All right, here's another 133 and it has no bent pins. <laughs> Let's try again. Oh, look at that. That actually went into the socket, I think. Did it? Yes, it did. Okay. I'm not sure the right technique for getting this in. I think I have to put a screwdriver down on that side and then you twist and it pushes the whole thing towards me that locks it. Yeah, that, that's definitely the right way. Yep, so that turns it that way. So into the slot. There we go. That's in there now. So that is not going anywhere. Now, how do we cool this thing? There's no fan. 
well, at least that I can see. There's the CMOS battery, it's three little coin cells. And the coin cells, there's a, it's actually soldered to the motherboard. So, okay, not easy to change. <laughs> well, I do have some low profile heat sinks, but that's too big to fit in there. And I have this one, but this is from a 486. So that's not gonna work because it's not flat on the bottom. And this is like a Pentium one here, but that's clearly not gonna work because there's just not enough space under the keyboard. Uh, this one here, no, that's not gonna fit. It's too tall. Uh, this one here is gonna work. <laughs> it's pretty crappy though, but at least it does fit. I have several of these larger ones, which I think would fit, but well, they're not gonna fit in here because there's just other components in the way. So I think it's gonna have to be this um, pretty puny little thing here. <laughs> That's gonna be it. It's not very tall, <laughs> but I think it's better than nothing. Now for attaching, I'm gonna use this thermal tape here. So I'm gonna cut off a couple strips of this. Tape is peeled. And now we <laughs> just stick this down onto the CPU. I kind of wonder if there was an actual heat sink that was designed for this that would maybe push up against this metal plate here. Oh, never mind. <laughs> There's a thermal pad there. Okay, well, let's get this off. <laughs> maybe I should uh, have looked. All right, yeah, thermal pad um, <laughs> with heat pipe. Okay. So I think that went on like that. And that's what those two screws are. I think that like pushes down. Well, I don't even know what that does to be honest. So let's just uh, put the screws back in. So not totally uncommon with these types of old laptops is uh, your hands would get very hot typing on the keyboard because the heat sink <laughs> was sitting under there baking. <laughs> that is just par for the course. Um, you know what? I'm gonna take this off real quick and I'm gonna try to put the keyboard connector on first because that looks not easy. Okay, the trick for the keyboard connector. This is a connector that actually can lift up <laughs> to make it easier to get the connector in and out. There we go, it is back in. So that's the trick. So it doesn't fight you. You don't have to squish it back in there. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's just get the plate in here now. All right, we just get all these screws back in. And then the keyboard goes back in. I'm not gonna clip that in because we'll power this on first. All right, power cord is plugged in. Things are stuck to me. There we go. No date, no change at all. Oh, wait. Um, okay, so it has a one and a disk drive icon but we have nothing, nothing at all on the screen. Oh dear. So let's see if we can see those icons that are on there. So you can just, just make it out there. Now I heard it beep, double beep, but we have no video output, none at all. Let's see about switching between LCD and the monitor. Nope. I hooked up the VGA monitor and it says it's 100 megahertz. I'm pretty sure we have a 133 in here, but whatever, it's working. We do have eight megs of RAM. Check some failure, of course. Keyboard working, yep, keyboard is working. All right, video display device is set for LCD or CRT. And you can set CGA, EGA, VGA, or monochrome. Why would you need to have it set <laughs> for uh, monochrome? What else do we have here? Memory cache, right back cache, sounds good. The battery is certainly dead. So there's really no point for me to set any of this up because it's probably all gonna get lost when we boot anyways. Uh, let's see here, whatever, that's fine. Keyboard features. Let's check out master. Oh, look, there it is. There's the SD card or compact flash card. Multi-sector transfers is disabled. Let's turn on 32-bit. All right, so we set this for user. Now we can actually configure this stuff. So let's do multi-sector. I don't know, 16 on. I don't know if there's like a, a specific setting you should have it on, PIO3. I guess we're not running a 32-bit OS, so I'll turn that off. All right, let's try that. And let's save changes. And let's see if we can actually boot into DOS. This CF card has DOS 622 on it. It's the one I always use. Oh, the screen, the LCD is working. Um, 
It is just very, very, very dim. Non-system disc. Hey, how rude. How do we turn up the brightness? Turn up the brightness. Oh, wow. That is a dim screen. It is at max brightness. <laughs> it is so, so dim. Wow, it looks a lot brighter in the camera than it does in real life, I gotta say. But it's working. Why don't we just set this all back to auto? Let's reboot and go back into the CMOS settings. Control, I'm pushing the wrong button. Where is delete? Delete, here it is. All right, I think F1 should go to the BIOS or F2. I can't even read it. Off angle, um, it's impossible to read. Yeah, this must be a cold cathode backlight and these just, wow, this sucks, unfortunately. Might be new old stock, but it is very, very dim. <laughs> All right, we're gonna set this to auto. We're gonna hit enter. We're just gonna leave this all set to however that was there. And let's see if this works now. Oh, there we go, starting MS-DOS. So it must have been that uh, setting for multi-transfer or whatever that was causing issues. So if we go to utils and we go to check it and we look at HD speed, I just wanna see how fast this is going. 2.5 megabytes per second. Yeah, not too bad at all. This is, oh, look how funny it is. <laughs> That's so weird, look at that. I mean, the screen isn't terrible other than the fact it's really dim. Funny, there is a brightness and a contrast control, but the brightness control, that's the, the minimum. And that's the maximum, there's hardly any difference. And then there's contrast up and down, but that has no effect. That would be for the dual scan displays. Let's put the keyboard back in place here because we, we know things are working properly, there we go. Okay, so I have no idea about DOS compatibility for this particular card that's in here. I ran Unisound. I thought that configures ESS things, but it says no plug and play sound cards detected. Looks like this BIOS was built in 1997, so that manual is a lot older. Oh, I didn't go into the BIOS there. Control Alt Delete. I'm just going to set the BIOS here to highest performance and plug and play OS. No. Okay, well, that's fine. PCI devices. Okay, there's some stuff in here. I don't know why. Um, integrated peripherals. Here we go. COM port A, COM port B, SIR mode, sound card. Enabled. All right, well, 220, IRQ9. Let's make it IRQ5. DMA channel 1. MPU IO, I think 330. Is that the normal address? 330. And the game port enabled. Okay, so maybe this is Sound Blaster compatible set like this. 220, IRQ5, DMA channel 1. All right, I'm gonna save this. Um, thoughts on this computer so far? The keyboard, let me zoom out a little bit. The keyboard is mushy. <laughs> it doesn't feel super good to type on. I'm used to ThinkPads and I had a ThinkPad at my job around 2000 or 2001. And of course that had an amazing keyboard. It just felt really, really nice. Um, I'm typing off at an angle here. So even though this computer is new, it just doesn't, it doesn't really feel that great to type on. The screen is getting brighter. It seems like just running it, it's warming up or whatever, but it's still, compared to the LCD that's just right up above it here, that one, this is, is it's dim. It's fine in here. It's not very bright down the basement, but if you took this out, outdoors, there'd be no way you could read it. Or if you took it into any kind of like really bright lit room, it would be, it'd be very difficult to read. What I'm trying to do here in auto exec is configure the sound blaster. Sound blaster i5 DMA1. Okay, good enough. What's really weird about this keyboard as well is that the A key is, everything is like very far shifted over here because it does have like home and insert and stuff over here, normal size keys, but the tab key is, is really crushed over to the side. In fact, here, let me swap this to the camera there so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So. I'm struggling because I keep typing like as if this is the normal part of the keyboard and I'm like shifted over a key. Okay, the other thing that's weird is like control alt on this keyboard or like way over here, then it has the windows key. So it's function control alt windows backslash spacebar. Just a weird layout that you'd get used to obviously, but me typing on this thing, it just feels very non-standard. Now one thing I'm noticing here is I don't think there's a fan in this computer. I think it is passively cooled. And that's a good thing, although maybe it's not. Okay, so Sound Blaster is configured, supposedly. I wonder if there's a jumper that I need to set to change the CPU speed from 100 megahertz. I'm pretty sure that I put in a 133 meg chip. Okay, the mouse pointer is working. There it is, moving around. Oh, boy, you probably can't see that at all. Let's zoom in again. 
So there's the screen. So yep, there's the mouse pointer. It's very fast, the acceleration, but it is absolutely working perfectly. I'm gonna try running Doom here. So I'm gonna set up the Sound Blaster here. Music card, sound effects card, Sound Blaster is 220, IRQ5, DMA1, four channels, save and run Doom. Let's see if we have working sound on this thing. Where is the volume control? Oh, the colors, the colors. It, the red is like orange <laughs> and it's so dark. Now this is a dark demo. Okay, we don't even have any sound at all either. So maybe this uh, particular ESS card does not work without setting up these drivers, but I'd have to do some hunting around. And that's definitely not the Puma disc there. Well, let's just try this out. Oh, it's really dark. Like the gamma on the screen is so dark. It's very difficult to see. <laughs> now this is normally configured for the mouse and I don't know what's going on because it doesn't seem to be working here, even though it was just working a second ago. Ah, uh, boy. Okay, yep, there we go. I am gonna run got by right by those guys. It's running though, performance doesn't seem too bad. Not too bad, although, well, it is running at only 100 megahertz, so that's not great. Uh, which is the door to open? What's the action key? I don't remember. Hello, open, there we go, it's that one. There we go, no, stop scraping me. Open, exit, there, no, 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 turn, turn, turn. There we go. <laughs> I didn't shoot anyone. Yeah, the uh, the red color is very, very orange for whatever reason. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's it works. Let's quit. And we'll see that in the DOS mode there. Yep, there it is. That's red. <laughs> it's, it has not the color balance on the iPhone down here in the basement struggling. It really is an orange color. <laughs> I do have Windows 3.1 on my compact flash card here. And, oh, it's set up for the Interwave Gus sound card. So it's gonna give us a bunch of errors, but it does run. Uh, not without the video drivers for the Sirius Logic. Boy, the mouse isn't working in here either. That's very strange. That could be a Doom problem. Without the video drivers, we're not gonna get the full screen on here. There might be, oh, there's the volume control. I wonder if it was down all the way. Hmm, okay, well anyways, we heard the computer beep, so it does have a, a working speaker. LCD, CD, there's like page up there, page down. Um, there might be a way to scale the screen, although I don't really see that, but I actually have to say I like this non-scaled uh, LCD here. So we can tell that this is 640 by 480 and there's this much of a border. So this panel is 800 by 600. And here in Windows, I mean, it's okay. And you know what? It's not particularly ghosty. It is pretty responsive. So those dual scan screens at the time when this thing was out were freaking horrible. This on the other hand has decent refresh rate. So if you move your mouse pointer, you're not just gonna immediately lose it. But it's pretty disappointingly dim. And I am curious, and Don, if you're watching, put a comment down below to let me know, was it this dim when these were new? Has the backlight aged even though this thing was unused? Well, the mouse is still working here in edit. So that's a bit funny that it wasn't working in Windows, but maybe I have a configure for a bus mouse or something. All right, so I'm running Mod Master XT, and it says Sound Blaster Pro 2 was found, and speed test, okay, so let's try playing some music here. Well, there's no sound. Let's try turning up the speaker. Nope. I am really not familiar with the ESS sound card stuff at all, so maybe there's a mixer, a software mixer that I need to run to turn the volume up, uh, because we're not hearing anything. You know, to be honest, is this thing even beeping? Let's see, Control G. How do you make the computer beep? Uh, I'm just gonna power it off. And we'll power back on. Let's hear if we hear a beep. Because maybe the speaker's just not working anymore. It will definitely beep when I first turned it on. There's a there's a key click option in the BIOS here. I'll turn that on. Oh, there it beeped. Okay, no, there was sound. Uh, let's see if we have the key click. Yes, I do hear the key click. It's very, very quiet. Turn up the volume here as much as I can. Wow, that's it. All right, let's try Mod Master again. I'll plug some external speaker into it here. Oh no, it's working. Wow. That speaker is just terrible. It's unbelievable how bad that is. Okay, the volume control does work here. Let's turn it up, see if it gets any louder.
All right, so did you hear that? That, that was a laughable. I'm, there's got to be something wrong with the speaker. Like it's it's failed or something because there's no way that that's the way the sound was on this thing when it was new. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hook up some external speakers. All right, so the internal speaker has stopped making sound. Let's flip the switch here. Oh, wow. That sounds unbelievably bad. I cannot believe how bad that is. There must be something wrong with the sound output circuitry on the laptop. Maybe there's like bad capacitors in here or something because that sounded horrible. I mean, the mod is playing properly, but the sound is really, really tinny and there's no bass at all. So there's gotta be a fault or something in this computer. There's no way, there's no way it should sound like that. What I can do is also run the Adlib jukebox program here, which I think should totally work. And let's hear if the FM synthesis sounds similarly horrible. Yeah, bad, really bad. All right, how do I exit this? F2, stop. Um, there are, well, there's more highs actually here, but there is zero bass whatsoever. It just sounds pretty horrible. Well, I think that's all there is really to talk about here. Uh, this computer is brand new, but definitely there seems something wrong with the sound output circuitry on it. And unfortunately, this little latch was already broken, just like right out of the packing material. So that just failed on its own over time. The screen, while it is active matrix, is decent viewing angle wise. Um, well, it kind of gets very washed out when you look at it off axis, but at least straight on, it looks fine. It's got decent speeds. You know, so when you do DIR, it's not a smeary mess, but unfortunately it is very, very dim. And then the whole computer is a little creaky. So if I had spent thousands of dollars on this when it was new, I probably would have been kind of PO'd a little bit. The screws that hold the screen together maybe aren't tight because as I move the screen back and forth, I can feel the two halves, the plastic has a seam right here. I can feel them moving a little bit. Now I have to remember that in the 90s when this thing was made, so like mid 90s, I think all laptops were pretty much like this. They were very flimsy and very plasticky and creaky. And it was only really the IBM ThinkPads and probably the Think, uh, sorry, the Panasonic Toughbooks, which were like boat anchors, solid metal and everything that weren't creaky. But when I worked on like a Pismo Mac laptop, um, maybe that was similar vintage to this, I don't know exactly. That also felt very plasticky and creaky and you know not super great. And kind of like, like this thing does. Um, the whole thing is just, yeah, a little creaky. Now, we are used to modern aluminum laptops and they are very solid. Even the thin plasticky cheap ones, like I have a cheap Lenovo Flex thing, whatever, it was $400. Even that is not creaky, but it is plasticky. But yeah, this thing is a, it's a boat. It's a bit of a boat. But I guess at the time it was very capable. And you know what? I guess the fact the CPU is underclocked it's not very warm. Like I don't feel any heat coming out of this right now. So that's good. I am very curious though. Let's just pop the keyboard off real quick here. I just want to feel what this uh, plate feels like here. Oh, it's only warm. I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely conducting the heat away from the CPU, but not in a way that's like burning hot. So that's kind of a neat, that's a neat setup actually. But at the same time, I remember back in the day being very annoyed when the keyboard got really warm. Like the warmth coming out of the keyboard and the wrist rest from the spinning hard drive always really bugged me. So it kind of got uncomfortable like on a summer day when the heat was just pouring off the computer. Nice though that there's no fan, so that's pretty cool. Mouse is working, that was with just Q mouse, so that's cool, so that's easy. You don't need, oh, I must reboot the computer because there's no more mouse. The keyboard layout is a little odd, as I said, like. I would think that this should be the alt key, but it's the backslash key. And let's try to get out of here. So yeah, I gotta do a little bit of gymnastics to do it. You don't need any special drivers to get the ESS audio drive working. So that is a bonus if you have one of these and the sound circuitry has good quality output, you're gonna at least get 8-bit Sound Blaster Pro type support out of it. So that's a thumbs up. 
It is sweet that it's got a floppy drive and a CD-ROM, but specifically the floppy drive. So that just makes it easier to transfer stuff in and out of this thing. And really, ultimately, this computer is kind of exactly as I expected it to be. All the stuff I talked about at the beginning of the video where I was like never super impressed with the laptops of this era, they were super expensive. And yet, you know, you got a machine that was felt very compromised and that definitely feels like what's happening right here as well and please remember like my thoughts on laptops of this era are just my opinions and i know lots of people out there probably love this era of laptops and you know are pissed off with what i'm saying here but that's just the way i feel about these and um even a brand new one here we had a brand new unboxing experience it's it's underwhelming it is definitely underwhelming to me at least and one thing that is neat about this computer here is that it is truly a desktop replacement, meaning even without that docking station, you still have access to a full suite of ports on the back, serial, game port, parallel, video port, and the sound stuff on the side. It just means you can actually like truly use this thing. And incidentally, since it's been running, maybe there is a fan in here, I don't know. It's pretty warm right here on the bottom. The CPU is under that area. So there you have it. There's the Alpha Top Green 753 new old stock laptop. I do hear something floating around inside. I think it's the piece of plastic that broke off the clip. It is inside the screen. But yeah, there it is, brand new, right out of the box. Thank you very much, Dom, for saying this over to me. I'm gonna have to put in a, a normal hard drive into here. Maybe not this one, this is a really noisy one, but I have some nicer Seagate ones that are quiet. And I'll install Windows 95, or maybe I'll install Linux on here. And, and yep, there it is, the eject button just came out on its own. That is not, that's not a good design right there. It should like click in and then stay in, but it seems like just moving this around, it kind of came out. So yeah, if you were putting this in your bag and that button were sticking out, you'd stick it in your bag, it would rip it right off. And then you wouldn't be able to get your cards out very easily if, if the card was the type that went inside the computer fully. Thank you very much, Don, for holding on to these things all these years and then send me a brand new one to unbox and feel the experience of the uh, kind of mediocre laptop era. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really fun to do it, but uh, at the same time, it definitely reminds me of, yeah, like, like I said, why I, don't, why I don't love this era. So yeah, cool. All right, well, thanks very much for watching everyone. If you liked this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know exactly what to do. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. It really helps me out. I appreciate it, especially for the second channel. And of course, thanks to my patrons. Their names are on the side of the screen right here. They get early access to videos and they make it possible that I do this full time. So I owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Thank you very much, everyone. So that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye.